Okay, it's great to see all you guys. Um, so I changed the title um, because of all of last week, I thought this talk might be of more interest than the talk I'd originally planned. Um, so this, was, uh, this talk is about some of the work we were doing in preparing for the uh, hard steps that's going into the field. So uh, if you heard this talk already, there's going to be, I'm going to remind you what mobile health is and so on. Just forgive me. Um, okay, so, uh, in mob so our big goal here is uh, to promote uh, behavior change, maintenance of that change. So those are two big issues. It's one thing to change behavior. It's another thing to maintain it. Uh, and the primary focus of our lab is, on, um, is with individuals who have a chronic illness, so less so wellness as opposed to a chronic illness. And we're, we very much want to contribute to the behavioral field, so to test causal behavioral science. So there's two types, in mobile health, there's, uh, there's two types of ways that we provide interventions. Uh, one way is on the far right, that's the pull, and that's where the user decides, uh, I really need some help right now, they go to the phone, they may find, they may access like Headspace or other types of apps to help them breathe deeply, but they decide, oh, I need help right now. And then they access it, they, they pull content. The other type of intervention that you have in mobile health is a push, and this is where uh, the phone or the wearable, either one, uh, in some way interrupts the user and attempts to provide support. So like the wearable might vibrate and uh, you might see a little message that suggests that you might want to get up and move your arm. So that would be a disrupting sedentary behavior kind of message. Uh, pushes are, so we experiment both with pulls and pushes, but pushes are of particular interest because of their potential for uh, negative impact, and that makes anything that has both could have both a positive and a negative impact. Those are the things you really want to experiment with. Uh, and in particular, the negative impact here is that people uh, become habituated to the stimulus, and then they they don't even see your notifications or the vibrations by your wearable, and you're no longer able to help them. Or they delete the app; they get aggravated. So uh, in most of our micro-randomized trials, we're really experimenting with pushes. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is just give you a little brief one-page introduction to a, a micro-randomized trial. And when I think of uh, these trials, this is the parts I think about. So it's a combination of a factorial experimental design, so there may be multiple intervention components, or what we would call multiple factors. And there's uh, at least one of the factors has this is sequential experimentation going on. Um, it, the sequential experimentation may use a variety of algorithms, either online forecasting, like uh, forecasting how many more times in the day you're going to be sedentary, and that determines your randomization probabilities, or it could use reinforcement learning. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, each of the treatment factors or intervention components, they often occur at very different time scales. And they tend to target different near time or proximal outcomes, too. So if you're a behavioral scientist, this all fits very well within behavioral theory because they often have these uh, causal models in which you have different interventions. They impact near time outcomes and then you have a distal outcome. So they have this conceptual mediational model. And that model underpins the design of these experiments. Um, and then uh, usually there's some sort of budget on the number of times you can interrupt people per day. So like a, it's a probabilistic budget. Like at least in our world, it's always a probabilistic budget. That is, on average, we will uh, provide a message to you, push a message to you uh, two times a day, something like that. Uh, and that's usually to manage burden, so an external constraint to prevent us from aggravating the user. And whatever we do, we have to be able to provide the ability to do causal inference at the end. So this is how I think of a micro-randomized trial. It has this probabilistic experimentation, and you can do inference at the end. 
And uh, we talked about berry fit last week. I just thought I would uh, point it out again. It's very much in that line. Uh, there were two factors that were randomized at baseline, so like a two by two. And then every day in the evening, there was an intervention that was randomized. It was a reminder. Tension spoke about that. Uh, these, in this particular study, these were text messages, although most of our studies have to do with notifications or uh, where messages are wearable. <clears throat> and then this other randomization, so this is the fourth factor. This was the, these were tech, in this particular study, it was text messages uh, with text messages about being physically active. So, and these could, these were randomized five times a day. This was only randomized every evening. These were randomized at baseline. So you have four factors here, each, uh, and they occur at different time scales. So to me, this is a classic kind of setup, in some sense, in the sense that it has all these factors. Sense to stop, we also discussed that last week. Um, this is a, a, in some ways, it's much simpler than Barry Fit, because it only has one factor. And that one factor is a reminder to access um, uh, these exercises, there's three apps, two of which the team built uh, to help people manage their stress. And the idea is while they're trying to quit smoking, if they can, if they can uh, get a reminder at a time, they're, you know, at, at, a right, at the right time, that will help them manage their stress and they'll be less likely to relapse. Um, so in this one, there, was, there is an algorithm we developed because um, we wanted to stratify that randomization by whether or not they were stressed or not. On average, one and a half times when they're classified as stressed, around one and a half times when they're not classified as stressed. And so this one actually, it's almost done this study, and it is does have this algorithm going on which forecasts the number of stressed times for the remainder of the day. I, I mentioned this last week, we use very sim simple forecasts. There's a lot of room for improvement here. Um, so with a micro-randomized trial, the kind of data you get, regard, uh, so wait, let me just make sure we're all on the same page. So the, the randomization is occurring with the actions. That's the only part that we manipulate is these actions. And how does that randomization occur? It could be just with probability 0.3, you know, between uh, two options, or it could be uh, a multinomial probability, or it could be according to some algorithm that does a forecast and that tells you what the probability will be, or it could be with respect to an, uh, uh, some sort of learning, an algorithm that's attempting to uh, skew the probabilities in favor of a better, deter better performing treatment. And that again will determine these probabilities. So we always think of these actions as randomized actions. So we have context, action, reward, context, action, reward, so on and so on and so forth. And I just gave some different names. Some people call these utilities, some people call them costs. And I purposefully index the reward by T plus one. That's just so that we all know the reward comes after the action, not the same time as the action. <laughs> That's just a mnemonic to help me. <clears throat> yeah, Lauren. Yeah, it's the proximal, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so when I communicate with uh, uh, computer scientists and often statisticians, I'll use the word reward. When I communicate with behavioral science, I'm, I'm so glad you asked this question. When I communicate with behavioral scientists, the reward just doesn't make any sense. And uh, so then I use the word proximal outcome. Yeah, the problem is when you communicate with statisticians, we have another term called potential outcome and it gets very confusing. So better just to, yeah. So I wanna go to some of the challenges for um, learning while you're experimenting in this setting. And these were the challenges we were trying to deal with when we were designing the next round of heart steps, which you, if you weren't here last week, you don't know what I mean, but you'll see shortly. So, um, so uh, I just want to remind everybody what these are. So all these algorithms are, they're just a way to do sequential experimentation while you're trying to uh, uh, learn to choose actions in a way. You want to choose actions in the way that's uh, most useful for the individual, but you also need to learn, to, uh, you have to experiment to determine that. So it's how to best select the action after observing context. We're, we're trying to learn this 
mapping from uh, context to action. And ordinarily, one is looking to learn a policy, and that is this mapping from context to action, which maximizes some sort of sum of rewards. It could be discounted, which is the way I wrote it here, uh, with gamma between zero and one. It's a discount rate. But in other settings, it could be over a finite time, and it could just be the total rewards. It really just depends on the, the setting and how you want to define that. Uh, I just rewrote it in terms of the, I just took the expectation of the reward given present context, ST, and present action, AT, and I wrote it here um, just because often you see it in this framework. That's the reason why I wrote it like that. <coughs> so what are some of the big challenges, at least that we were thinking of when we were designing uh, this study? Uh, the first thing is we, we realized that, you know, this wasn't like uh, a lot of problems in robotics uh, or uh, even in some areas of, like infectious diseases even, um, in that this domain science is really immature. I mean, that's why it's exciting to work in this area, because of the immaturity of the behavioral science. Sciences, And so it's, it's like we attempt, when we design these studies, we attempt to measure or get proxies for everything we think is important, but we don't know what's important. <laughs> so there's unknown unknowns here. Uh, so, and these manifest themselves as non-stationarity because it, if, it appears as if the user has entered the same context twice, but in reality, they haven't. And it's because of these things we, we haven't measured. So it looks like the reward function is evolving, but in reality, that's a falsehood. You know, so that's what, that's what I mean by, that's where I see the non-stationarity coming from. Uh, also, in these studies, because we're working with clinical populations as opposed to wellness, uh, there tends to be a large number of stakeholders. They all have to come together to design the study, to conduct the study, uh, to apply for money to do this. So at the end, you have to make it possible for all your stakeholders to play a role, to have, um, to be able to do whatever analyses they want to do, mediational analyses, I don't know, structural equation analyses, you know, you name it, whatever causal analyses these guys want to do. So you have to be careful not to harm the rest of the team. So this has a number of implications. First of all, uh, whatever algorithm we use, if we misspecify parts of the models in that af algorithm, that should not harm our stakeholders. Uh, we should not randomize with probably one or zero, because that would harm our stake. That's the clearest way you can harm your stakeholders, is randomize with probabilities very close to one or zero. But another way is if you, random, if you have an algorithm which uh, will mess up everything if the model it assumes is not correct. That would be bad as well. Um, and then uh, there's this uh, issue with uh, high variance. So this is uh, experimentation in the real life of an individual. So you get a lot of variance, both with, like uh, in the sense to stop uh, study, the number of times people are stressed varies a lot from day to day. It's just amazing how much it varies. And it varies a lot from person to person. Some people never get physiologically stressed. Some people pretty much stay physiologically stressed. It's just, it's very interesting. Of course, this is when they're trying to quit smoking. I'm talking about. So you, you want to uh, pay attention to this reality and also the reward function that is the mean of the reward given current context and action uh, can be complex. Uh, particularly because the context itself can include all kinds of summaries of how you got to that time point. Um, so, for example, in the smoking study, I mean, in the uh, physical activity study, we're going to see one of the aspects of context uh, at a in the morning is how much variance there was in your activity level over the past seven days at that time. So the context can include a variety of summaries of how you got to that period, to that time. So you, the it's high dimension. Okay. Uh, and the, uh, an, another issue too, and this is not, I had a big discussion yesterday morning, went on for two hours about this with our team. And um, if you're comparing something versus nothing, that's where you're gonna get your biggest signal, which is great. 
But most of the time in mobile health, when you're comparing something versus nothing, the something will not cause trouble right then and there. Uh, like if I give you uh, an activity suggestion, you're not going to walk more when I don't give you a suggestion and less when I give you a suggestion. It, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, but that activity, so I have, I may not have any impact on you with my activity suggestion, so it's a non-negative reward for sure. Non, you know, it may be zero. But on the other hand, all of the negative impact of the, of the action, me giving you a suggestion, pushing a suggestion to you, is in the future. You habituate. You don't see my stimulus, you know, I can't help you in the future. And that's, uh, certainly that means that we have to pay attention to delayed effects at a minimum. And that also makes things very complicated when you start to go down the bandit paradigm. Um, but I'll talk about that shortly. I mean that, um, I mean that the, it is a function of, the context is high dimensional and, our, and the behavioral science can give me some cues as about what variables might go in there, but we really don't know. And um, so we would like to have some robustness built into any algorithm we run um, so that when we do uh, move the probabilities of getting a treatment, uh, the way in which they're moved, like if the probability increases of getting a treatment, we want that increase to really be due to the fact that you're more responsive, not because I misspecified this reward function. Um, but, of course, it's a high noise setting, and we all know that noise is the great smoother, right? It may be, yeah. And you're going to see me take advantage of that. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to talk to you about heart steps V1 and V2. I talked about heart steps last week, so if you were here, I think I, yeah, I did. Um, so the first one, the, this is about uh, uh, developing a mobile activity coach for people who are at high risk of adverse cardiac events. Uh, the first study was with uh, sedentary individuals. It was only six weeks, so it was a very short study. Uh, the second study is for 90 days, so three months, so it's, it's a lot more. And this study is, all, is with people with stage one hypertension. So they're not yet at the level where we're going we're gonna to recommend a drug. We're, they're at the stage where if they change their lifestyle, they could prevent themselves from having to take a drug. So it's a kind of a sweet spot. They, and they'll come in, this is a, it will be run at Kaiser in Seattle, and they'll come in as soon... As they're t the doctor tells them, Man, you've got hyper, you know, you have stage one hypertension, you know, it gives them a whole, uh, they have a whole meeting about that, and then they, they're immediately recruited into the um, study. So, uh, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna talk, we're gonna use data from V1 to help inform how we wanna design V2. That's what's going on here. And this talk is mainly about how we did, how we did that. Okay, so uh, just to, for people who weren't here last week, just so you have a schematic of V1 in your mind, uh, there were two factors in Heart Steps V1. There was an evening factor about planning your activity tomorrow. It was randomized every evening. And then there was the within day factor, component, intervention component, and this was randomized at five times a day. And this is the component that we're, uh, we're really interested in in the next heart steps. Um, how can we use, how, uh, in the first heart steps we just randomized on average three times a day, you got a message two times a day, we didn't bother you. Uh, in the second study, we wanna know can we uh, increase the number of times you get a message if you're more responsive, decrease the number of times you get a message on average if you're less responsive. The idea is to, if people will habituate to the message and then uh, we will back off, they will dishabituate to the message, but, and then become more responsive, and then we can intervene again. Uh, here's an example of one such message. They come up on your lock screen. Uh, I think I showed the same one last week. Um, this was in the morning on a work day. They're always tailored. It, uh, they're tailored to the weather outside, the time of day, uh, whether you're at work or at home. Um, and something else, which I forgot. 
weekday weekend. Right. Uh, and so you can see the little message here. And I want to make uh, the, con the comment that in general, and um, that the set of actions, that is, the set of intervention options or the set of uh, settings for your factor, that can de depend on the current context. So there'll be some context in hard steps where we're not allowed to send an, a message. One context I mentioned last week was the context in which the sensors indicate you might be operating a vehicle, and so it's unethical to interrupt you and send a message. But in general, all of the intervention components associated with them, there will be contexts which, uh, in which the set of possible things you can randomize between is constrained in some way. <clears throat> so the set of actions are, uh, depend on the context. Okay, I'm just going to give you the results because we're, we're moving to heart steps two here. So um, the tailored activity suggestion. So, okay, so uh, people who are sedentary around these five times, this is related to their work schedule when they go to work, when they come home and so on, uh, they get around 250 steps in a 30-minute window in general, on average. So this was really nice because the tailored activity suggestion is compared to no suggestion. Uh, uh, indicated or uh, provided evidence for an initial increase in step count over the next 30 minutes by 271 steps. This is more than a doubling of the person's step count. So it was really a big deal. Uh, the issue was by, uh, it was a 42-day study, by halfway through the study, the increase had, uh, uh, was estimated to only be uh, 65 additional steps, and it wasn't significant anyway, so we might as well just put zero there. Uh, so. This was a big issue, and this is what motivated the design of Heart Steps. This is one of the motivations of Heart Steps V2. This said, look, we can't just continue to send these messages on average three times a day. You just can't do this. People are habituating. They're not going to be responsive anymore. Um, and that's why we're going in the direction uh, that we're talking about today. Uh, so I just wanted to give you some ideas. Some, some of the features that appear to be predictive of the subsequent 30-minute step count was how long you've been in the study, uh, recent number of messages you've been sent, so how burdensome, you know, have you been pinged a lot. Uh, your current location is quite interesting. How variable your step count was in the window around that decision point over the prior week. Uh, how active you were in the prior 30 minutes. How active you were on the prior day uh, and current temperature. Um, these were some of the variables that were predictive of the 30-minute step count. And then um, I just repeat them up here. And now then the features of these, a subset of these features, appeared to interact with treatment. And the way we went through this is we went through the features one at a time. Remember, the purpose right now is we're designing Heart Steps V2. So we're trying to kind of be open to the possibility of features interacting with treatment. Again, time and study, how often, how much we've been bothering you recently. <laughs> this is a recurring theme in my life. Uh, uh, your current location, uh, how, how variable your step count is around that previous, around that pe previous time slot. The more variable, the more responsive you tend to be because that means there's a lot of room in your life to be responsive. Um, okay, so when I think about what we're going to, uh, what might be in any kind of, um, what might determine the probability of whether or not you get more, you're more likely to get a treatment, these aspects of context, at least initially, are coming to mind. Okay, so V2, so the idea with V2 is to use uh, an RL algorithm to select whether we send a tailored activity suggestion to the person or not. Uh, and, the, I, and what we want to do is we want to maximize the sum of rewards. Here in Heart Steps, the reward is the 30-minute step count following each of those five times. So when I say sum the rewards, I mean sum the 90 times 5 rewards, right? Um, 90 times 5 step counts. Um, so I'm just reminding us five decision points per day. This is all set according to the user, okay? It's my five points might be different from BBOSH's. It's 
Uh, and the reward, like I said, it's that proximal outcome that we, uh, it's the 30 minute step count following each decision point. And we want to have, we want on average over the study for people to be the most active they can be. That's kind of the idea here, at least in this around, in these time slots. Okay, so uh, what you're, yeah. No, in these time slots. The total step. Right. Right. We're still working on this particular factor. So in the next study, if this factor pans out, it'll go to the next study. And then the distal, and that's a year long study. And now the whole ball game is the distal outcome all of a sudden. So it becomes a separate ball game. Um, but right, so far we haven't seen, one of the big concerns we had was that people may just change the time at which they're active. You know what I mean? They just, they're active around those five times and never active again when, but that, we haven't seen any evidence to that. Um, those five times, so th the five times were chosen, uh, the user sets them, uh, but they're traditionally, they're related to their work schedule. So um, that's how we guide them in that selection. So like right before we go to work, uh, around midday, around mid-afternoon, right when you're coming home from work and in the evening. And that all came from that original analysis of um, jawbone data that indicated greater with in-person variance around these times. Now, I would have liked for us to have separate times set on the weekends from the weekdays, and I haven't been able to get the team to do that yet. Um, and it's getting pretty late. I doubt I'll be able to actuate that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But they have the same meaning for each person. Right before I go to work, the content, the information content is the same. It's right before I go to work, right around my lunch time, right around my mid-afternoon, right... Yeah, so that would be their lunch time. And then, so everybody, you have your own lunch time, I have my lunch time, so you, it gets set. And actually, in the, in the, in Hearthstone's V2, you set up an hour window, and the message can come during that period of time. Yeah. So we allow a little bit of flexibility, because you know from day to day, your work, your lunch time might vary a little bit. Right. If you're walking at the time of a decision point, you're considered not available. Um, we, because the kind of messages we're sending are messages for new activities. Um, last week I mentioned um, we have another, uh, one of my postdocs has another study where you're only available if you're currently walking because all the messages are about extending your current activity. <laughs> so it really, the decision points and the choice of the intervention, the intervention are intimate to, intimately intertwined. And there's enormous behavioral science that goes into all of this. I mean, I don't want to, you know, be shallow about it. Um, I mean, if one is thoughtful, enormous amount of behavioral science goes into all of these. Um, yeah. What, Naiwa? So Oh yeah, we got the minute by minute step counts. Oh yeah, remember one of, in a micro-randomized trial, one of our goals is that all our stakeholders can do their analyses after the end of the study. So, you know, we're not, we're gonna do our very best not to cut anybody's throat. Um, yeah, exactly, I'm totally with you. There may be things we don't capture because of the, the, the battery on the phone. For example, um, uh, location, we only capture it those five times because if uh, uh, we sampled, 
Now, we may have changed that, um, thinking of another talk, but another conversation we had. But at first, we were really worried about sampling the location all the time and running the user's battery down. So there are constraints on what we can do, but it's not us that's put, we're not putting constraints. It's just the setting, the battery of the phone puts constraints. Okay, I just want to go over a banded algorithm for you and me. I mean, I know a lot of you guys know a lot of this. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so the idea is, first of all, remember this is the expectation of your reward given S is your current context. That's where you are, what you're doing right now. And A is your indicator of treatment. So this is my mean reward, the mean of my 30-minute step count given my current context in action. Um, so we have to initialize some parameterization for this. Then we go, uh, we, we input the current features, uh, that is, of the context at that time, and we select uh, a treatment, in our case, send a message versus not. After that time, uh, we, the sensors record the reward. Here. Uh, and then an algorithm, we use another algorithm which updates the mean of this reward, that guy. So it updates the parameters in that reward. Uh, and it uses this, uh, this example of the context action reward to do that updating. Uh, and then, uh, then what happens is, uh, the, uh, the bandit algorithm now, I should have put bandit algorithm, uses the updated mean reward to select the next treatment, and then we return to three. So we just kind of cycle through like that. And the two, um, algorithms that are going on, and I should have blued part of step five too, but I just want to make sure that it's crystal clear in our mind. All banded algorithms actually involve two algorithms. One algorithm is for selecting the treatment, and the other algorithm is not, uh, it has nothing to do with reinforcement learning per se, it's just learning the mean, estimating the mean reward as a function of current context and action. There's always two algorithms going on. And every banded algorithm, and you can just mix and match as you so desire what those two algorithms are. Um, so uh, we're going to start down our path, and then I'll just, I'm going to peel an apple, unpeel it, and make it more complex as we go on. So the first thing we said was we're going to go for a linear reward, mean reward. So you see, I've written this typical stat notation. It's just a combination of features. And these features can be summaries of how you got to that point, like how active you've been recently and so on. Um, so we're going uh, uh, to use a, ba a Bayesian paradigm. Uh, so we're going to use a Bayesian linear regression model. Uh, so that's going to be our learning algorithm, is a Bayesian linear regression model. So we're going to initialize the eta parameters, with, in our case, with a Gaussian prior. And then it's going to be really easy because we are using a, a conjugate prior on our parameters. It's going to be really easy to update the posterior distribution of those uh, coefficients. Uh, and it is indeed a normal distribution. Man, it's just really nice. Um, okay, so uh, then the other thing we're going to do is the other part of the algorithm is we're going to use what's called posterior sampling. And that's, uh, and some people call this match something or other. But uh, in the CS world, it's called posterior sampling. It makes sense to me because we're using the posterior distribution. Anyway, so uh, given the current context, we'll choose the treatment, which according to our algorithm is expected, has the probability of producing the greatest number of steps next. That's kind of in our mind what's going on. Okay, we're just unpeeling this apple right now. It's very coarse. No, Thompson sampling is posterior sampling. It's just that posterior sampling can be used across a variety of ways that have nothing to do with Thompson sampling. And so it's kind of good to separate that uh, Thompson sampling is actually the uh, conflation of two algorithms, a Bayesian, uh, a Bayesian regression algorithm, like a Bayesian-Gaussian process model, and a posterior sampling type algorithm. You know, and it's just important to realize that there's two, because when you go and you read across the literature, people mix and match left and right. Yeah. 
we're putting a prior on the regression coefficients only. So it's a normal uh, big Gaussian multivariate prior. Exactly. This is how you and me, we think the same. I love the Bayesian. This, now we're getting off topic, just for a second, OK? But for people who are not, I'm not a Bayesian. But why am I using a Bayesian algorithm? Man, it's regularizing. It's doing L2 regularization. And even better, I'm going to regularize in a much smarter way than using CV. So I love the Bayesian paradigm for that reason. <laughs> That's all I got to, you know what I mean? Uh, OK. Let me, uh huh. Yeah, we're, we're, we're unpeeling the apple. Unpeeling the apple. Give me time. I mean, I like, I'm totally with you on this. Okay, so now we're going to go through those challenges and talk about how we change that algorithm. We're now getting further into the apple. Um, the first issue is you have a lot of within user variance, right? Just noisy, noisy data. So what's our solution? We're using a bandit. Why are we using a bandit? Bandits learn much for faster than full RL algorithms. So if you're familiar with reinforcement learning algorithms, you know that in a bandit, the target is the immediate reward. In a full RL, it's the immediate reward plus a prediction of the future rewards. Those predictions can be very noisy. And if they're too noisy, you're dead. It doesn't matter. So it might be better to incur some bias in order to reduce variance. These are all bias variance trade-offs. But give me time, men. I'm still on your side. Just give me time. OK, so the bandit acts as a regularizer. And so in the uh, RL literature, it's known that uh, if your goal is to uh, maximize a discounted reward, a mean discounted reward, with like um, a discount rate of 0.9, when you go to learn, you should probably learn with a lower discount rate. In other words, the learning discount rate is considered a bias variance trade-off parameter. So the, the bandit acts as like total regularization. It chooses the discount rate of zero, right? It just gets rid of that prediction of the future rewards entirely. I mean, it's so no it says it's so noisy, just ignore it. I'm, we'll continue down this path, though. Just give me time, man. Okay. Uh, and the other thing is we're going to use a very low dimensional parameterization. Now, again, I have to un unwrap this, too, because this is not quite right. Nothing is quite right here. It's going to get more and more right as we go along. But, uh, but the key point is we're going to use a low dimensional parameterization. Again, that's an effort to trade bias and variance. There's no way the true mean reward function is a linear function. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> OK, and then uh, this is what Joseph is talking about. Uh, we're going to use a prior. The prior is going to act like a regularizer, an L2 regularizer. But real, what's really nice is now we can be really thoughtful about our prior because we have the data from Harp Steps V1. And um, we decided, because of all the things that were going on, that the first week of hard steps V2 is microrandom, just straight up constant probability microrandomized. So we'll just update. The bandit won't start till the second week. Actually, it starts the third week, the first week. But anyway, the first, the first week will be like a constant randomization, and then the second week we start the bandit. So these are all, the whole purpose here is to manage variance. And why is this managing variance? Because the more I can tightly pin down this approximation to the mean reward the more I reduce variance. I mean, that's what's going on. I mean, this is our attempt. But it's, yeah, OK. So things are complicated, though. So the non-stationarity. So this, for a long time, uh, we were going to have to, we thought we would really have to confront hard. And um, so what we were doing, and it, I already mentioned this is, uh, we think it's, it's due to our inability to, to know what we really should be, what features should be important in the current context. Um, uh, by the way, one could say, oh, Susan, man, you should do lasso, all kinds of things. But remember, we're in a setting where we have high within user variance. The more parameters I have, the more variance I'm going to get. So I'm really in, I'm pushing bias and variance left and right here. Okay. 
So with non-stationarity, it's a problem for us. So we, so our first uh, effort was we would use uh, a Gaussian process prior for these regression coefficients. Um, this particular version is an AR type version, and uh, what it, the way to think about it, that's at least the way I think about it, is what it does is it forces you to exponentially discount past rewards. So in a very smooth way, you only use the more recent rewards in your learning algorithm. Now in the end, uh, another, uh, another thing we were doing to solve another problem helped us with the non-stationarity. And so that when we tuned this, uh, this tau parameter is a tuning parameter, and in the end, when we ended up tuning it, we tuned it away. So we ended up not, ha this is not going into the original, the final version. But I, I thought people might be interested in it, because I'm definitely in the future, we may end up using some sort of Gaussian process prior to exponentially discount, to discount data from the very far past. I'll indicate later which of the solutions later accidentally helped us with the non-stationarity. Um, so, um, we already discussed this, this problem that the immediate effects tend, tend to be primarily positive. That is, we provide a suggestion to you, you're more likely to walk. Uh, you don't tend to get less walking because we provide a suggestion. Uh, however, you, they uh, induce habituation and burden. And so um, it may be that over the entire 90 days, uh, you really shouldn't be bothering people at every five of those times, because if you would back off a little bit, you might get much more responsivity, so that the total step count over those 30-minute intervals over the 90 days may be much higher if you back off some of the time, so that you allow people to be more responsive, and then back off again if they stop reducing their responsivity. So you can imagine you, you're, you increase, back off, increase, back off, you might get a much higher total step count in those intervals of time. So what's our solution? This is why I called it a butchered bandit. We're not really using a bandit. We want to, what we want to do is we want to add to the current reward. Okay, so let's go back to full-scale RL, if you're familiar with that. And full-scale, the way to, at least for me, conceptually, the way I think of full-scale RL is my target in my regression model, that's you know, I'm a statistician, so all I do is think of regression models. The target in my regression model, my dependent variable, my Y, in my regression model in full-scale RL is the immediate reward plus some prediction of the rewards that would accrue under the current policy. That's what it is. If I can figure out a way to have a lower variance prediction, it might be slightly biased, but it'll be a lot lower variance, I might do a lot better. So that's what we're trying to do. So that's, that's the, the background here. We're trying to have a, a lower variance target. Um, some people call this the target, the reward plus the value. So the reward, the thing, the, what we're going to add to the current reward is the, uh, is, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to build a proxy Markov decision process. This proxy Markov decision process has its context, uh, all the variables in its context will either be sampled independently, so there's no, there can't be influenced by the action, or they evolve deterministically. So what that's going to do is allow us in real time to roll it out. Very, uh, and we always start with the mean reward function that we currently have in hand. And then we use that mean, re mean reward function that we currently have at, at the most recently learned mean reward function, then we act as if, uh, it, for this proxy MDP, all the states are either IID or they evolve deterministically. And that's the, that, that is going, we're going to use to have put our prediction of the future value. And so it's a... It, Yeah, um, so I was, I'm going to elaborate on some other thing we're doing, but um, uh, that was what I was going to go into. But this one, uh, so I'll just give you a little bit more information. So uh, we have this, we, we're using dosage, prior dosage, as a proxy for burden. Now, in the future heart steps, we're going to also collect more directly a measure of burden. And that will get in there as well, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. So we're using dosage as a, a proxy for burden. And we have a way to update the dosage, 
prior dosage in a deterministic way that uh, evolves according to a, a Markovian type process. So that's the deterministic component of the state of this MDP. All the other aspects of context are just, we just sample uniformly from that person's past history, that individual's past history. We sample uniformly from their past history, their, all the other aspects of context, and use that when we roll out that MDP. So you can, you know, so it's a pretty simple MDP that you can actually estimate the Q, the value, the state action value function for. Um, and so the proxy that we add to the reward is the difference between the total, our prediction of total future rewards if you send a message now versus minus our prediction for the total future rewards if you do not send a message now. Uh, and that prediction, if you've had a lot of treatment recently, is quite negative. So it dings that reward pretty hard. Um, but I, 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 uh, I'll eventually I'll have, we'll get this so, once the study goes in, it's all finalized now, but um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to give a talk in more detail about this part. There's another aspect to this algorithm that I think is interesting, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, okay. Um, so we had already, all of us, been talking about this last week. Uh, we want to ensure the ability for everyone to be able to conduct their off-policy learning after the end of the study, whatever machine learning methods one wants to do, you know, it's fine. We want everyone to be able to use this data. Uh, and we want to be able to do causal inference. This is particularly important for the behavioral scientists. So what we're going to do, remember uh, the RL algorithm has two parts. It has the part, the learning algorithm that's learning the mean reward function, and we're using a Bayesian a linear, uh, linear regression, and then it has the algorithm that's choosing the actions. We're using posterior sampling, right? Those are the two algorithms that make up together Thompson sampling. So um, the the choice of the posterior sampling that is using is one in which you explicitly randomize because I choose the next treatment. The software chooses the next treatment according to the probability that, that treatment is best. So that's an explicit randomization. That is just like randomized study. It's just like a randomized study. We know those randomization probabilities. It's all known. So, and that is, and that is one of the reasons why we did this. Instead of replacing the uh, that the part of the bandit that has to do with action selection by a UCB. UCB also uses exploration, but it does it implicitly using stochasticity in the data, inherent in the data. But that's not helpful for our stakeholders. They're not going to be able to do weight, importance weighting. They're not going to, you know, I mean, we need explicit randomization. So that's the reason why we... Uh, and then we're going to also uh, constrain our bandit. We're not going to allow the bandit to think it has so much evidence that one treatment is best in a particular context. So we're going to keep the, uh, and this was the decision point two and point nine, was the decision for the probability of getting a message. OK. Um, so I already mentioned that the mean reward function is likely pretty context co complex. And here are 30 minute step counts here. I think the greens are at the times of, tr of uh, messages and the blacks are not, I can't remember. I'm pretty sure that's the case here. This is from an actual person in uh, Parsons V1. So, I mean, it's just hard to extract anything. Um, so what are we going to do to manage the complexity? And if you're, from my work last week, you can almost impute what I'm going to say. What we're going to do is we're going to use contrast coding for the action. Because we know in experimental design, contrast coding is, protects you in a ton of ways. So contrast coding here, we don't have probabilities with one half. Contrast coding is the same as centering the, the actions, the binary treatment selection, AT, by the randomization probability. And of course, we can do that because we, we're the one, we're, our algorithms are outputting that randomization probability. You know, we have that ability. So, so what we're going to, what we're doing is we're, uh, we replace the usual linear model by a model that has two aspects to it. Um, first, here's the action centered. 
So we have features, and I already listed uh, the features that I thought would be important for interacting with treatment earlier. So this is a vector of those features. I've centered the action, so this is akin to contrast coding and experimental design. And what it does is it makes this part of the linear model, so if you put a linear model here, or no matter what, it, put, it makes this part of the model orthogonal to this part of the model. So it protects you from misspecification. So the variables that go in here, these are all the big predictors of your 30 minute step count. There's a lot of those guys. Our conjecture, uh, as always, we're working on uh, this idea of parsimony, is that there's only a few variables that are important for decision making. Those are the variables here. Uh, we, we could use a very simple model there, but a, a more complex model here. And, and we want to make sure that it, when we, if we misspecify this part of the model, because we're doomed to misspecify it, uh, we're not going to bias our randomization probabilities inappropriately. So that's the reason why we're using this uh, contrast coding or uh, centered uh, thing. So as the Thompson's, because we're, we, our algorithms are choosing the randomization probabilities, we're able now to update the, ba and this is a very f odd Bayesian regression model now, right? It's a different model at every time, right? Because it has pi t in it. Um, but the nice thing is we have this orthogonality and we don't need uh, our, our model for the baseline, all the predictors of 30 minute step count don't need to be, uh, that doesn't need to be accurately specified. We just can't have collinearity. Um, so I wanted to show you an example. So this is from a paper we wrote. Um, it was in, uh, I think it was in ICML. And um, this is with this action selection. Okay, so let me tell you a story. Okay, so until this time, so we statisticians, we use contrast coding all the time. We know about contrast coding, okay? You know, for us, it's natural to do contrast coding. Well, in the world of bandits, with non-stationary reward functions, everybody says the only way you can, you always get a regret, that is, the average rewards uh, for your algorithm minus the best average rewards, um, no, the best average rewards minus the rewards for your algorithm, it should grow at rate T in time, capital T, if that's the time. It's at rate T. And they said that's the best rate you can get in the non-stationary setting because there's just nothing you can do. Well, um, we realized that by contrast coding, you could allow non-stationarity into that baseline function, and you could then prove square root t regret, which is the usual kind of regret in the stationary setting. So that was a really nice. And uh, here's the, the pictures that kind of illustrate this just so, okay, we're gonna go slowly, because if you're like me, you're looking at these pictures and you think, I have no idea. So, okay, so the, this axis is the decision point, you know, five times a day, 90 days. Uh, and then this axis is the cumulative regret with respect to the optimal policy. So the optimal policy is, and it's scaled, these are scaled. So th it's, a, it's the optimal policy, the total number of steps for the optimal policy minus the total number of steps for our, our method with this contrast coding. Uh, so, and we, call, we called it action-centered. You see the regret kind of just trails off for us as time goes on, whereas for standard Thompson sampling, the regret just grows. So this is like T, and this is like, uh, what did I say, square root T. Um, okay, and I, I give you some indication of the simulation setup. Uh, the context was only three-dimensional. The, the true uh, baseline function was nonlinear. Um, it could evolve, it evolved with time. And then we had a very, uh, and we used a linear working model. In both, in, in both cases. We only had, we didn't have a Gaussian process prior, we weren't using a proxy value for this, okay? This was just a really, we just wanted to look at this part, the contrast coding. Um, the sad reality, and this goes back to some of Ken's comments yeah, last week, is uh, I was working with a, a, an electrical, an, a postdoc who was an electrical engineer, and he really didn't want to do this, this slide. What is this slide? This is across the 500 simulated users. 
What is the variance in total regret across those users? Right? Right. So to encapsulate, I wanted to look at the quartiles. I think it's the 75th and the 25th quartile. So uh, I had to have a much longer, the y-axis is much broader, as you can see. Okay, so the dash lines, the dash blue line, the top one is the 75th quartile for the, the action-centered. And then there's a dash line down here almost at zero. I mean, it, for some people, it works like a charm. Of course, for some other people, it doesn't work so hot. And then the dash line for the red is the 75th quartile for the standard Thompson sampler. Of course, the bottom one is all, everybody's down at zero, the 25th. So, the, so in both cases, for both algorithms, there are some people that, you know, this algorithm is like the charm in the world. I mean, it's just wonderful. But then there's an other, so I, I got him to put this in that paper because I wanted uh, the people to see that, look, there's enormous variance across people when you run a Thompson sampler person by person. You know, it can perform, some people, it just, they just get unlucky and things don't go well for them. And other people get really lucky and things go really well for them. Um, and that's a big concern and it's, um, it's led to us actually not for this iter the, this Thompson, I've pretty much told you what the Thompson sampler is that we're, we're implementing in heart steps. But now we're gonna run an, an additional study with a smaller group of people and we're doing some other things to try and manage this a little bit more. Uh, so I wanted to give you some open questions. Yeah. Oh, the solid lines are these lines. It's just they get flattened because the scale is just destroyed because the variance is so, like so bad. I mean, that just makes it, you know, that really emphasizes. Yeah, there they are. See them down there? <laughs> okay, so I want to uh, give you some open questions. I think they're interesting. Um, uh, and maybe I have some ideas, but most of the time I don't. Um, so um, how do we think about a setting where you're trying to learn a policy, you know, at the same time? You're, uh, how do you think about that in a non-stationary world? How do you devise an optimality criterion? So maybe we should aim to track the best non-stationary non policy. That might be a, you know, so it's not a learning problem, it's a tracking problem all of a sudden. So I love the electrical engineers because they know about tracking, it comes out of the sensor world, um, and I think there's things we can learn from those guys um, uh, because they deal with tracking problems all the time in the sensor, sensor world. Uh, and uh, uh, in future, what we really want to do is we want to allow, we want to have a schedule of intermittent off-policy analyses that go on as the trial progresses. And uh, these should all be causal. Uh, they may concern different outcomes other than reward, might concern burden, for example. They might use different structural assumptions. And they should be valid even if the assumptions we're using in our RL algorithm, in particular this linear model for the reward, is false. And in our case, this will be the case because of the random, we're doing explicit randomization as opposed to UCB, which uses implicit randomization. So what would be an optimality criterion for an algorithm? And I don't know how to mathematize this. It's just like, I feel like I should move in this I feel like we should move in this direction. Maximize, so here's one idea. I like my idea one better. Maximize finite time, total T reward, subject to bounds on the power to detect a particular pre-specified causal effect. So you decide what your prime, some causal inference you want to do, one that's pre-specified, it's like your primary analysis in some sense, and you, you, uh, max, you try to maximize your finite time total reward subject to a, that constraint. So it's like a probabilistic constraint. Uh, and then I give you another one. This is essentially what we're doing, something much coarser. We, we're just implicitly doing this because we clip the randomization and prevent it to go to zero or one. Uh, so we have bounds on our exploration. We're not doing anything, uh, 
we're not explicitly uh, maximizing an objective function, but one needs to move in that direction so that we do aim to maximize pot uh, potentially constrained objective functions. And I'm particularly interested in this one. I, I think this is, I think it would sell very well in our world to our collaborators. Uh, so what are some of the challenges? Uh, I'm telling you, the missing data issue is profound in this field. And if you're doing an online algorithm, you really have missing, I mean, how do you manage missing data in real time? So like with this hard steps, the one that's going in right now, I don't know, maybe in the next month, uh, I think it will anyway, um, we had to come up with little protocols for every kind of thing that could be missing. And what we would do, I mean, it was just pure. I mean, we need some online approach to doing missing managing missing data. And I like this. It's prospective as opposed to going and finding yourself a statistician after the fact to clean up the mess. Um, uh, okay. We got to deal with this high between user variance. I, I showed you that before in the performance of the online algorithms. We need to manage that somehow. Um, at least it's gonna be some sort of trade-off. Maybe we can't, maybe the, the maybe we'll have to pay, uh, maybe we can reduce the between person variance at the expense of having fewer people have the perfect setting. It's gonna be a trade-off, we can't have everything. So we'll prevent a large number of people from having awful experiences by not enabling a small number of people to accidentally get the perfect learning experience. You know, it's something like that. It's some sort of trade-off. Um, this is the, just a conclusion. Uh, I just wanted to state, and last week I gave you examples of where the random... So the banded algorithm is just one way to conduct randomization. I just talked about it today. Uh, last week we, I talked about one, another way to do randomization based on forecasts or predictions. It's another way to do randomization. Um, so uh, the algorithm is part of a, our goal. This is our long-term goal, continual learning. And um, here's the collaborators. This is the electrical engineer guy, my, the postdoc. He was my postdoc. He almost killed me. Uh, Really, because, you know, statisticians, we don't think. I mean, you know, we think very differently. But he, he lived through it. Anyway, and, uh, and then there's uh, statisticians, HCI guys, um, computer scientists, uh, behavioral scientists, app developers. We all work together on uh, hard steps. That's it. I uh, know. The V. Hopefully that means victory one day. Yeah, it's the posterior sample. Right. Right, right. So what we did with Sense to Stop was we had to design a forecasting algorithm to forecast the number of times. At each time you were stressed, we had to forecast how many more times you were going to be stressed for the remaining part of the day. And we, we had to have access to data where the exact same sensor suite was being used with a similar population. And it was a lot of work, but actually I'm, I think the banded algorithm, the more you think about it, the more work. I mean, the minute you do anything online that is prospective, the amount of work is enormous because there's just so many ways you can mess, mess up. And the more you think, the more you realize. So I don't really, and in a sense, the banded algorithm is also doing a prediction. It's, it's modeling the mean reward function. So it's how are you going to, you, you have a, at hand a variety of predictions, and how are you going to use them? Um, are you going to use posterior sampling? Are you going to use... Uh, you know, I, I have a budget, I want one and a half on average. When you're stressed, I want an average of one and a half uh, notifications per day, and that determined the problem. You know, so it's just different ways. 
The bandit is more implicit how it guides the sampling, whereas uh, having a budget is more explicit. Yeah, but both are using model learning models, right? The great thing about randomization, though, is you know we can mess up a good bit, and the the study will still be okay. But if you're using UCB and you mess up, it's over. So. Yeah, Naiwa. Okay, Lauren. He says you should go first. <laughs> He's a gentleman. <laughs> Uh huh. Um, one of the points about how um, affirmation is all in the and the book group to point out the power of that is to do with the things and all the teachings. But are you able to have that back as you can have a reduction? With a two-arm study, for sure, we would power that way. But uh, and um, and in since to start, we powered best based on stress. Even though the that was the smoking cessation study, we powered based on stress, fraction of time stressed. Even though our real outcome was relapse, right? We wanted to delay relapse. So this is all related to the underlying behavioral model, the mediational model that underlies just about all of mobile. I mean, mobile health is essentially embedded in a mediational model uh, with many different pathways from the actions to the distal outcome. And each intervention component is targeting a pathway. But um, with a two-arm study, definitely we would do what you said. But with a one-arm study, which is what all of these are, right, we power based on um, the proximal outcomes or the rewards. Some aspect of the reward. So for example, I could make my primary analysis similar to the primary analysis, the overall mean reward or something like that. I, you know, the primary analysis I mentioned last week, that could be the analysis that I would try it and size this study for. But I would want to maximize the total reward subject to the constraint on the power or something like that. Yeah. Well, um, I guess if I'm talking to a traditional NIH kind of person, I would say the final, you know, you always run your factorial studies to optimize your intervention and build it, and then you follow that by a two-arm study where you compare your optimized intervention versus standard care or whatever the appropriate alternative is. So that's how I would talk to a traditional trialist. Um, and I think there is room for that here as well. Um, my interest is more on the continual learning, though, setting. But I could, at any given time, have a control group that I would, and then I do my intermittent analyses and I compare that to a control group or something like that. I think, I, I, I really, I'm not so, I think in my world, I, I just really, this two-arm business, it's just not, um, I don't know if it's going to be where we're going to end up in the end to be honest. But I don't want to depend on the mediational model so strongly. And we are doing that right here, right? Like we, so it's, it's, a, it's a risky business. Um, the good thing about hard steps is the proximal outcome is the distal outcome, really. We're just trying to get them. Even if we had a longer term study, probably the main outcome would be physical activity. Their ability to manage a stress test. Actually, that's the year-long outcome, year-long study. At the end, we're going to have a stress test. So, you know, so it, it's going it's more direct, right? So it's not as um, bothersome as the smoking study, where it's really depending on a mediational model. And do you even believe that model? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, whenever it's convenient. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's actually why we didn't go for 15 minutes, because we wanted a, enough of a time. Remember, these physical activities are not really physical activities, right? It's like one of the messages was, uh, why don't you walk as far away in the building as you can? I mean, we're not really talking about physical activity here. Like, go to, there's no treadmill suggestions or, you, you understand? Or another activity was, uh, why don't you, now this, remember this is where this is. This is not in New York City or in Cambridge, but why don't you walk until you see a squirrel? Well, I can, in Ann Arbor, it, you will not walk very long before you see a squirrel. You know what I mean? It's like, so they're like max three minutes. Um, so it really depends on the, but on the other hand, what we are doing is we're, we have this work that Ten Chin is uh, supposed to be doing, but he took a sabbatical with Bebosh for the last two months. And that's a, <laughs> uh, and that's where we look at the time varying minute by minute step count over after each decision point. And that's a curve, right? So now you have a curve. And you can make that curve go out to an hour, two hours, whatever you want. And you can see, does that curve change? Now, with heart steps V1, it wasn't sized for that. I mean, you know, the chances of us seeing anything are very little. But we'll have a lot more people in V2. I'm hoping we'll have 75. And so I have a hope that we'll... But if we develop the methods, then when that's done, we'll be able to do it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, right. I think after any one of these, this is why it's so important to have explicit randomization, in my opinion, because then everyone on the team can have suggestions like you have and can mine this data and do hypothesis generating analyses. And that's great. That's what we want. You know, that's what we want. And that's the reason why you would use this over something that depends on implicit randomization. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, how will it inform? Yeah, so the second study has a lot of components as well. You know, I only talk to you about the activity suggestions, but it's got a bunch of other components, which I cannot remember at this moment. It's got a randomization at the weekly level. I think it has a randomization, I think, every morning. So it ha it's a factorial study, too. It's just one of the components has the bandit. That's it. Um, so uh, that all of these come together. So some components will go away. So like in the first heart steps, we had that evening planning. Uh, it was every evening you could get randomized to plan or not. And it, it turned out to be really effective. But in the exit interviews, the participants hated it. So now, in the next study, Heart Steps V2, we have planning, but it's weekly rather than every evening. And it's because of the intense dislike by the participants. Um, so there's a lot of qualitative information that gets moved from one study to the next. Um, if, we, if our bandit really messes up in this 90-day, then I'm going to be pushed to really change the bandit a lot for the next one. You know, so each, each stage, we're, you know, that's the nice thing about the stage approach, right? It gives you room to mess up and you still can move on. Yeah, and that's what we did. We are, and we're using this proxy from that, that very simple Markov decision process. We built an MDP with the deterministic. Either the state is, either the parts of the state are deterministically evolving or they're IID evolving. And, but it's a new MDP at every time point. It's a new MDP because it uses the reward function that we have, that we've learned at that time point. So it's, 
It's like the MDP that you roll out at time five is different from the MDP that you roll out at time 300 uh, because it's using our most recent uh, estimator our, of the reward function. Well, it's a bias variance trade-off, right? Um, if, if, if the target in a regression, so think, let's go back to regression, you know, y equals x transpose beta plus epsilon. If y is really, really noisy, that means epsilon's very noisy. That means we're not going to learn the beta very precisely. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the noise in the y. And, but we still want to have enough of a signal that we're having these negative effects going on. Um, you know, we'll see. I mean, it's highly likely we're going to mess this up. I think there's a relatively good chance we'll mess it up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, we are doing it. In, in Heart Steps, we had, um, so like in the, phys, uh, the planning and in the evening. So what we do, so it's kind of a structured hierarchical way. And I don't know. You know, you, you have to decide if it works for you. So our, uh, our primary randomization is between something versus nothing. And if you're randomized to something, you know, it's, I'm sorry, something versus nothing. If you're randomized to something, then you're randomized again to different somethings. Yeah. In heart steps V2, all of our factors are like that. I mean, V1. All of the factors in V1 are like that. It's, we first randomized some, uh, nothing versus something, and then there's, there was two options for every something. And we... Uh, we randomized between them. And we actually learned, so like in V1, um, for the activity messages, it was don't bother the person or send an activity, a three minute activity message versus a, um, like a half minute activity message. So a half minute activity message, why don't you stand in and roll your arms? That's a half minute activity. And so there were the two versions. And we discovered in Heart Steps V1 that's, that the version like this, at least as best we can tell, has no signal. I mean, there's just, we didn't see anything. And so we, we took that component and moved it to a totally different. So in V2 now, we're, um, we're monitoring you for your sedentary behavior. We have a forecaster. I pray it works okay. That forecasts the number of times you're going to, you're likely to be sedentary over the remaining part of the day. And we use that to determine whether or not you get one of these brief messages. Why don't you stand up and roll your arms or something? And the reason we're doing that is because the participants in exit interviews loved them. They love those messages. They love feeling like they're doing something about their health by just standing up and rolling their arms. You know, so we're going to, yeah. So that, inf that also went, but so it, what happened was Heart Steps V1 made us bifurcate one of the factors into two factors in V2. That's what happened. Yeah. And the reason why I do that is because I believe the biggest signal is something versus nothing. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to preserve our ability to get signal here. Right, it could be, and you, you have to just think in your own mind, you've got to pay a price for this. You know, and you might make it even more hierarchical. So you might have some, nothing versus something, and among the somethings, positive versus negative framing. And among the positive, you might have two types of positive messages and two types of negative frame. You know, so you could make it, but you just got to be aware that every time you go down, you have less and less power, you know. Oh no, in fact, it's just one randomization. It's just, it's just the way I think about it. It's where I apportion my probability. Um, now, in the banded algorithm, it's only something versus nothing uh, for heart steps V2. Because we took those two, comp that one component and we separated it into two, two components.
one that would only be given at sedentary times and the other at, at any of these five times. I don't know how clear I'm being. Well, yeah. Well, it just depends on the test bed. Like, I, I definitely think the educational test bed is going to be one where you can move much faster. Because uh, our test bed is we have to get money from NI, National Institutes of Health. We have to bring a collaborative, we have to bring a collaborative team. Everybody has to agree to give up so many years of their life. They all have to agree to run a trial that I suggest. I mean, this is all non-trivial, right? I mean, it's a big ask. I'm asking a lot of these people. Yeah.